Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Faithful Conversations on Abortion. I'm Connie Ryan. I'm the Executive Director of Interfaith Alliance of Iowa, and I'm glad you've joined us. Faithful Conversations on Abortion is a series designed to be a tool to help faith communities hold community conversations regarding access to reproductive health care, including abortion. Our goal really is simple, to help communities of faith hold what may be on the surface a difficult conversation, but to enable all of us to hold that conversation in a thoughtful manner rather than one that is political or divisive. Abortion is health care. That is the theme of today's conversation. What is abortion and what really happens? Exploring the diverse experiences of abortion. Our panelists today are Dr. Amy Bingaman, who is an OBGYN in the Des Moines area, Reverend Debbie Griffin, who is a pastor of Downtown Disciple, Disciples in Des Moines, and Amanda Kimber, who is a reproductive health care advocate with various organizations over the years in Iowa and at a national level. Welcome to each of you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Dr. Bingaman, I'm going to start with you and um, kind of talk in, in facts. That's always an important way to, to start a conversation and talk with us about abortion from a medical perspective. Generally speaking, what is an abortion and reasons why people might choose to have an abortion or common types of abortion, the logistics around abortion. And then we'll get to um, the issue of laws as well, but just talk with us about what is abortion. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for putting this series together. I think it's incredibly important, particularly with all of the um, divisive nature of a lot of these discussions. I think it's really important, first and foremost, to understand that everybody's coming from a different place in their lives. And pregnancies, while it can be very joyful for some, for others can be quite devastating. So an abortion simply is the termination of a pregnancy. There's several different reasons why this occurs. There can be something called a missed abortion. So that's where a patient is pregnant. Um, they have no symptoms of a miscarriage and they come in and they are indeed pregnant, but the baby's not viable. So there's no heartbeat. One of the options for those patients is a medical termination or a surgical termination. Um, very similar to somebody who's choosing to have an abortion to not carry on a viable pregnancy. So it can be done with medication, which is very, very safe. It can also be done with surgery, which is also very safe. Patients can have an incomplete abortion where they pass part of the pregnancy and they continue to bleed, sometimes heavily. Sometimes it's an emergency setting in which we need to intervene. Um, and that is typically with surgery for those. Um, Ectopic pregnancies are a little bit different. Those are pregnancies that establish within the tube. Those are pregnancies that can never be viable. Um, so they need intervention, whether that's medication to terminate that pregnancy that's in the tube or surgery to remove that tubal pregnancy. So there's a wide gamut there, you know, and I think the most important thing for me as a healthcare provider is to provide objective options for my patients where they're at in their lives. So particularly passing no judgment um, and helping them determine the right course in their reproductive journey. One of the things that I think is particularly challenging is I feel that a lot of people have a hard time imagining themselves in somebody else's shoes. And the specific scenarios are particularly our marginalized patients who we see who already have access to health care. So a lot of times these patients are going to have difficulty obtaining contraceptives. So specifically women who are in domestic violence situations where they have to use their husband's insurance and can't get to the providers, um, our economically disadvantaged patients who may not have transportation rural communities sometimes don't have access to care as well um and then importantly i think every contraceptive on the market does have a failure rate so people can be incredibly responsible and still have an unplanned pregnancy so for some people like a trans individual a pregnancy can be so dysphoric to them that it would 
be considered life ending for them to carry a pregnancy. So, and for some people, it's hard to imagine, like, what would it feel like to be a trans with an unplanned pregnancy? And I think it's important to either try to imagine what that would feel like, or maybe step away from the situation and not <clears throat> give your opinion in that scenario if you can't imagine, or poverty where you can't afford to feed the children that you already have. So for me, that's where I think compassionate, objective care with reproductive rights are so incredibly important to provide our patients. Um, and my personal experience certainly lent to that quite a bit because I did have a contraceptive failure at 16. Um, and I had an unplanned pregnancy and some places where I sought help and care gave me very objective, compassionate care and other places, not so much. So, um, I think my personal experience has shaped the type of obstetrician gynecologist that I am. Um, I was also really poor at that time as a high school dropout. Um, so it's easier for me to envision um, the struggles that a lot of people are coming forth with an unplanned pregnancy. So I love your title of the series. Um, as an obstetrician gynecologist, without a doubt, abortion is healthcare. Um, and I think that <clears throat> the current climate in the United States of America um, is really questioning that. And I think um, it's incredibly unfortunate. Thank you. Um, and so I, I want to follow up on that with um, with you and and um, Pastor Debbie and Amanda, you can chime in on this also. Talk a little bit about the myths that we hear out there about abortion and and what it is and what it isn't. For example, um, there's a lot of um, rhetoric around late term abortions. And um, there's also a lot of um, rhetoric around uh, who who gets abortions and and um, that it's used for contraceptive purposes. So talk a little bit about the myths and how that really plays into this whole conversation. So I don't have the percentages right in front of me, but I think upwards of over 70% of women undergoing abortion have a religious affiliation. Um, I think it's an incredibly hard decision for people. Um, late term abortions are less than 2% of the abortions performed in the United States of America. So that is by and far not the majority of abortions being performed. Those are not performed in the state of Iowa. Um, the state of Iowa current legislation is that abortion is legal up to 22 weeks. Um, certainly it appears that that may change in the future. Um, but that is a misconception that that's a common abortion that's occurring in the U.S. And uh, if I could jump in, I loved, Dr. Bingaman, that you were talking about kind of the different um, sort of like medical indications that someone would have that would lead to uh, the termination of a pregnancy. So maybe it is that they just choose to end the pregnancy. It could also be that they have, um, they have the beginnings of a miscarriage or maybe there as a, a fetus that's not viable. And I think that that's such a myth that you just get abort, have an abortion to terminate a pregnancy because you don't want to carry it to term. And it's, it is a medical procedure that needs to be available for everyone, regardless of the reason they need to have it. And I think that this has been happening since I've been working on abortion rights. And it's been happening before that, that the individuals who are are being overlooked that are saying i have an intended pregnancy i want to carry this to term and something very bad has happened um all the medical indications that you could think of all those things that very bad have happened and i need an intervention immediately and this the pieces of legislation have made it illegal for me to access health care to save my life and i think that that those people are being overlooked and we're just not talking about it and they're just as important as the people who want to terminate a pregnancy for any other reason but the folks who are vilifying abortion are just go just saying like this this is just for the people who are flippantly getting an abortion and it's just not the case abortion is health care for a variety of reasons Absolutely. I, I agree. As a, um, 
as an ordained minister and a, and a pastor who cares deeply about the people in my community and, and my neighbors and the world, um, for me, without a, a doubt, abortion uh, care and access to abortion is uh, is health care. It, it's just um, without a doubt for me that denying someone the medical attention that they need is uh, goes against my religious beliefs. Um, and, and I think even for people that um, do not base their decision on a, a faith perspective, denying other folks their bodily autonomy and health care options for their body is unethical uh, in addition to be, being something that is in opposition to uh, precepts of many major religions. Um, one of the things that I look at, because it is, a, it is a, a very emotional issue for many people, for most people, and especially for people who are coming into this from a faith perspective, emotions can be very high. And uh, I encourage people, especially those people that identify as Christian, you know, to look at um, the word salvation, which in, in the New Testament is often translated from a Greek word, sozo, which can also be translated as healing and wholeness. And as we heard Dr. Bingaman um, explain to us, this is a matter of healing, and there's such a wide spectrum of reasons that a person might need abortion care, might need this kind of health care, and to deny someone access to the health care that could save their lives and um, also affect not only their physical body, but their emotional health as well that um, we, we might ask ourselves, you know, what those people that base their decision on faith might ask themselves, you know, what is uh, the compassionate response and how is denying someone access to health care a faithful thing for me to decide for someone else? Um, which is another big issue around religion, is uh, bodily autonomy, right? Um, for, for Christians, we turn to this belief that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And that means that we get, individuals get to decide how they honor their bodies. And it is not for me um, to tell anyone else how their body um, is receives health care, right? And how their body might be protected. Um, when we see the stories of Jesus, uh, there's examples of Jesus. He doesn't uh, just heal somebody without being in relationship with them. He generally is someone that is asking them, what do you, you know, he says, do you want this particular type of healing, he inquires and asks. He's not just making an assumption about someone else's body and, and what they want or need. So for me, I just feel like as a, I'm not a medical professional, so it is not my place to tell someone else what their body needs, what they need for their mental health and wholeness and what healing looks like for them um, because I'm not a medical professional and uh, so it's not my place to make decisions about who can have access to health care and who isn't. From a religious perspective, we want everyone to have access to health care. And if I could just add a couple more, I have so many thoughts. I love this panel. <laughs> uh, but Connie, when you talked about myths, listening to Dr. Brigham and Debbie, I am I think a lot about the myth that people regret their abortions and that they're somehow very flippant 
in their decision making. And I will tell you, as someone who has had two abortions, I every day I am thankful that I was able to receive that health care. I in no way regret my decision. I uh, and, and it was a relief. It was healing for me to be able to access that care. And I think a lot of people have that same experience. Obviously, everyone's experience is different. It's on a spectrum. But a lot of people felt like me where it was it was such a relief. And I think that because there is shame and stigma that is forced upon the procedure and people who receive this procedure, it's somehow not talked. It's not talked about. And so it, it can be interpreted as regret or shame when really it's just the external factors. And I think people do not go into this flippantly. I've spoken. I've for, worked for years on abortion funds and spoken to individuals who are having uh, abortions. And it is clear that a lot of thought goes into this. A Guttmacher Institute report just said that in they looked at abortion patients in 21 and 20, 2021 and 2022, and more than half of them had had a prior birth. People who are having abortions know their body. They, in a lot of cases, are already parents. And they're not going into this flippantly. They know what they need for their health care. And I think that that is just a quick misnomer that people are shooting off all the time. And to to build off of that, Amanda, um, I spend a lot of time, as you all know, I spend a lot of time at the state house in Iowa, um, sometimes too much time. And um, we've had hearings, multiple hearings over the last several years on this issue. And uh, each time I am amazed at the stories, first of all, um, how strong and um, willing that people are um, to tell their stories and how brave they are in that process. Um, but each story is different. Each circumstance is different. Each um, set of how they make a decision is different. Um, and so I'm going to go back to you, Dr. Bingaman, and talk about because that's in the legislative process and the political process. Um, and this is being recorded the spring of 2023. Um, what are the laws that um, help you as an OBGYN to, to help patients? And what are um, current laws that are really inhibiting you from being able to care for your patients fully? Um, so, you know, right now in the state of Iowa, I would say probably the hardest thing was the 24 hour law that got passed because it just provides another barrier um, for patients to get abortions for health care. So um, that law was put in place that they must be seen but cannot have an abortion until a full 24 hours later. So particularly, we don't have a lot of abortion providers in the state of Iowa. So if people are having to travel quite a distance. It, it just makes that that much more challenging for them to access that health care. Um, I would say I feel very fortunate living in Des Moines where I can refer my patients easily to Planned Parenthood, who's just been a phenomenal resource um, in Des Moines. We also have the Emma Goldman Clinic in Iowa City. Um, so those clinics are very helpful. I think I, I'd like to piggyback just a little bit because I think the shame that's associated with abortion is, is a real issue. Um, even for the patients that I see, because it's almost like abortion hasn't been normalized as healthcare. So I do a silver lining of everything that's happening is I think that it is really having people come forward and saying, this is part of healthcare, you know, let's normalize it. Let's not shove that term under the rug in the corner. Um, I too have ha spent more time, um, at, kind of doing more political work. Notoriously, physicians really have stayed away from being in the political arena. And I think for us now, we're feeling an obligation to be involved in this. Um, there's been a couple of very poignant stories that I've personally heard that I thought were very effective. One woman spoke and she said that her and her husband were very excited to be pregnant. And then they found that their baby had a terminal diagnosis. So a diagnosis that was not compatible with life. And they really struggled with whether or not to have an abortion or carry the pregnancy. 
And she got up on the stand and she said, you know, I included so many people in that conversation to figure out the right thing for me. I spoke with my husband. I spoke with my doctor. I spoke with my mother. I spoke with my clergyman. But you know who I didn't ask? I didn't ask the state governor. <laughs> so I thought that was just so telltale of how this journey and experience is for people. Um, I also had a patient that I did an elective abortion for um, who was also very excited that she and her husband were expecting and then found out she had metastatic cancer. Mm -hmm. So she had a choice because we still have choice right now. And her choice was that she could have an abortion so that she could get aggressive chemotherapy and live a few years longer for her two existing children, or she could carry a pregnancy and probably die within the year. So I did her abortion and she lived for several years um, after that procedure to be with her kids. So make no doubt about it. There is, this is a complicated issue. It's, it, it's complex, you know, um, you can't pigeonhole this. You, you can't say that everyone is the same. And that's my real concerns for a lot of the legislation that's out there. Um, and it will truly be devastating for our communities. Thank you. Um, real quickly, just to um, throw a little twist in this. Um, Amanda, folks get confused about Plan B, and we've we've heard a lot of this, um, especially in Iowa, um, the last few weeks, and um, and whether or not Plan B is abortion. And so, could you share with us? I know you do a lot of advocacy around this. Um, what is Plan B? Is it legal now? Um, spring of twenty twenty three, and. Um, is it abortion? Is Plan B abortion, or what is it? Yeah, I'd love to. I love that you're putting the time stamp on, stamp on this because things are just changing so rapidly. So now we're in, in the spring of 2023. Dobbs has overturned uh, Roe v. Wade, and we in Iowa are currently uh, awaiting a six-week ban at the legislature. And so, you know, this could all change uh, tomorrow. Um, so, um, like Connie mentioned, I do a lot of work in contraception. I'm a I'm a huge proponent of contraception. I was definitely that kid, like throwing all my friends in the car and driving them to the family planning clinic when I was 16 years old. And I just have sort of gotten crazier as the years have gone on. Um, so um, uh, thankfully contraception is still legal. And at the, you know, at the federal level, like we're seeing people, you know, we, we, we watch, we watch reproductive health laws across this, uh, across the country and people are starting to get a little more aggressive in limiting contraception. So, it, you know, they've come for abortion first, like contraception is next. So let's, let's all try to protect it as for as long as possible. And Plan B gets uh, um, confused sometimes uh, because, again, there's not a lot of education about it. And um, sometimes it does get confused with medication abortion, uh, so which is mifepristone and misoprostol. Um, and... Uh, emergency contraception generally is it's a it's another form of contraception you know it's intended to prevent a pregnancy plan b is one type of that emergency contraception uh you know just like um uh like we have various over-the-counter drugs that are pain relievers like ibuprofen and acetaminophen there are various types of emergency contraception they have different active ingredients but they all are are intended to prevent a, a pregnancy Plan B is the trade name for one of them. So you can actually get it over the counter um, and it uh, you don't need a prescription for it. So um, Connie and I work on, on helping get it out as much as possible to the folks who need it. Um, but it is, it's commonly lumped in with abortion um, and it is actually not an abortifacient in the medical sense. Um, it is just another form of contraception and it is still legal. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that for us. So I'm going to go back to um, the genre of politics. And um, this is for any of you that, that want to chime in. Um, what should be the role of politics in public policy when talking about access to safe and legal abortion? Who wants to start with that? Well, I, I 
I will. Um, <clears throat> just because I think that a lot of times um, these uh, political movements to deny pregnant people access to health care are often um, presented in a religious perspective. And so I'd like to point out that number one, not all people of faith agree on this issue. So to uh, try to put forward legislation and assume that uh, there's some moral religious high ground is just inaccurate. And it's, it's not um, scriptural. It's not consistent to our nation being a, a nation of interfaith and religious diversity. So I, I oppose uh, legislators making any personal health care decisions for me or anyone else, but I am also highly offended when they presume to present it as a moral, ethical high ground based on a few people's religious perspective in a nation that claims to have religious freedom. So I, I'm highly opposed to that as a person of faith. And um, also because it is a medical issue, which we know in the United States, uh, both the, the CDC and the WHO have said that, you know, the, the reality, the facts are that um, maternity mortality rates are not good in the United States of America and are getting worse. So we are putting people's lives in danger. And um, not only are the rates going up in the United States, but compared to other countries um, who have similar wealth as our country, uh, we, we are much lower. Than, than most other countries. So there's a lot of reasons for politicians to stay out of uh, personal medical health decisions. And uh, I would be my preference that they would leave those decisions to individuals and their medical providers. I, I'm just not sure why they feel that they know what's best for all of these diverse situations that we have been talking about here today. And, and I would just like to throw one out in particular, one, um, a case of an individual that I know who was in the process of being liberated from an abusive marriage, was trying to uh, set herself free and was um, raped by her, at that time, spouse became pregnant. And we know that sometimes this is how people are controlled uh, in abusive situations. And to have to undergo, first of all, um, violence, and then to have to not have access. I mean, thankfully, at that time, this person did have access to an abortion and was able to to have that and has now gone on um, to have a very full and rich life and, and have children uh, at, in a different marriage. But there's just another reason why we don't know the situation of individuals. And, and I fear that this person might not be alive uh, today had they not been able to get access to the health care that they needed and escape that physically and emotionally abusive relationship. Thank you, Debbie. Reproductive coercion. That's what it's called. It's a form of abuse. It's, it's horrible. I'm very thankful that your friend had you in her corner for sure. So um, I'm going to keep my statement pretty brief. It's pretty obvious how most gynecologists feel about politicians being in our exam rooms. Um, I'm going to say that I would never dream of putting a black robe on and thinking I could be a judge or walking into a Senate and 
feeling like I could participate in that process. Um, so I wish they would not try to put my white coat on and be a physician. Well, I wish you would go be a legislator. That would be amazing. <laughs> You'd be so good at it. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, my frustration has, I mean, Connie knows this. I've, I've worked with legislative bodies for uh, years. And my frustration with when I was working one-on-one -on -one with legislators has been them intervening in areas in which they have no expertise. And they'll usually call upon advocates to help them um, weigh in on the impact of legislation. But when it comes to abortion, they complete anti-choice legislatures rarely, if ever, actually consult the medical community about legislation. They just ask anti-choice advocates, which who represent a very small minority of religious individuals. And uh, their sole purpose is to end access to abortion because of religious beliefs. So in a perfect world, I'd love to see legislators and policymakers actually consult the medical community to learn more about reproductive health. Trust them for the experts that, that Dr. Bingaman is and that medical professionals are. And in no other aspect of, of legislative make or legislation does this happen with such flippancy that legislators just know, think they know best. And it's, it's up to us as advocates to continue to talk about uh, these experiences and hold them accountable for what they're doing. So, you know, this is just such a divisive um, topic in all areas of our life, but particularly in, in faith communities, it can be, not always. Um, do you think that we are, as a nation, able to have um, respectful, factual conversations on this topic? And how do folks go about that, um, whether in a faith community or otherwise? Um, how do we how do we approach the conversation to be able to hear and listen to each other? I, I would just say that everyone loves someone who has had an abortion. Those of us who have had an abortion can help to destigmatize it by sharing our stories. It, that is not an easy task. It has taken me years to feel comfortable talking about it because of external stigma. And now I'm in a place where I feel comfortable talking about it. But I think the more that we can add our individual stories mm -hmm. to the narrative and, and let our loved ones know that this was a part of our life, I, I think that that can help to bridge that conversation a little bit more by making it, at, having people have a, a bit more of a personal connection to the topic. I think forums like this are great. I've done a couple other panels, which it was really more information seeking than trying to um, push one's beliefs upon another. So not necessarily you have to 100% agree with my um, perspective, but let me tell you what reproductive rights look like in the arena of the office setting and how taking that away could translate into how it affects you, your daughter, your sister. Um, so I think really forums like this are great, kind of more controlled, uh, a little less polarizing maybe, but I, I think it's hard. Like when I talk to somebody who I just cannot help them see how this impacts me and how important their vote is to make sure that reproductive rights are still accessible, it's hard for me not to get really riled up. So I think that's that's part of the issue. Like we feel really strongly about it. And so does that opposite side. They feel really strongly. And so I think the goal is really to try and help people understand this is why I'm passionate about it. This is why we really need to keep abortion as health care and maintain our reproductive rights. Like it's mind boggling to me that they're contemplating taking away contraception. I mean, it is just the most ludicrous thing I've ever heard in my life. So now you're going to take away and contraception is not 100 percent anyways. And believe me, I take care of lots of adolescents and I love my adolescent patient population. And I will tell every single one of them, the only thing that's 100 percent effective in preventing pregnancy is abstinence. But that is not realistic in the United States of America. <laughs> 
why the politicians don't start going over the easy accessibility of pornography on the internet is beyond me. So like, if you're going to let our kids get on porn sites for free and see everything, and then you're going to have schools teaching abstinence only based curricula. So now my kids are going to turn to looking at the internet to get their sex education. And that is horrible. So, I mean, the whole thing, that's part of where we all get emotionally charged for those of us who are taking care of people with contraceptive failures or access to contraceptive access or condoms or, you know, we have the highest sexually transmitted infection rate in developed countries in the United States of America. That is abysmal. So see, that's what I mean. I get all fired up. And nobody calls me Dr. Bingaman. You guys are like really throwing me. No one calls me Dr. Bingaman ever. You can call me Dr. Amy if you want to be formal. <laughs> Pastor Debbie, your thoughts on can we can we have um, conversations that are respectful? respectful and factual and particularly in faith communities around pre reproductive health care and abortion? I think, of course, it's hard. Um, there's no doubt that we are very emotional around this issue. Most people are. Um, but I think of all the places where we ought to be able to have good, honest, vulnerable and peaceful conversations are in our faith communities and that we ought to be having them there. Um, and I appreciate um, so much what everyone has said here today and, and especially um, thinking about the, um, the wide diverse reasons that a person might be seeking abortion care, helping us realize that there's just not um, any way that we can make these decisions for other people when, when the situations are so vastly different and our bodies are so different. Uh, so to, I think for faith communities to not shy away from the topic is, is exceptionally important for us to have safe, sacred spaces for people, adults and youth. Uh, and I think it starts when children are small, it's, it's important for us to start talking about our bodies and to talk about sexuality. And especially when these things are not going to be, it appears that they're not going to be able to talk about some things in school around sexuality and health and our bodies. The, the religious setting, the faith community can be a place where parents and youth and children have a, a space where they can wonder together about these very important things around healthcare in our bodies. What does it mean to be a sexual being? What does it mean to, um, to be whole and healthy? And how do we respect the diversity of beliefs, even within our own faith communities? I mean, most faith communities are, everyone in that, that community is not going to agree on this. So are we going to demonize one another and, and judge and condemn? And the word shame came up earlier, shame each other. Or are we going to um, provide information, education, grace, love, and support to one another and provide a space for people to wonder about these things with those many people that they trust, right? Um, their family, their medical providers, uh, their um, religious leaders, but, but without condemnation. And information is power. I, I think that one of the reasons these things are so emotionally charged is because we, we are coming from a place of fear. 
And fear-based conversations are not generally productive and are most usually very divisive and and highly emotional. And gosh, for people of faith, especially for the for the Jewish faith, the Christian faith, or the Muslim faith, do not be afraid is one of the things that is just repeated over and over and over again. And I, I think when we don't have healthy conversations and information, that's when, when fear uh, rears its ugly head. Debbie, I'm so glad you brought that up because I, when Connie, you know, gave us some prompts and said, what do you think that faith leaders and communities could do? I scribbled down, like, don't be shy about talking about reproductive health and not just abortion. I've seen some great examples of health education done by faith organizations. I went through, I think it was our whole lives I, yeah. I, in, a, in a church setting in my Lutheran church in St. Yeah. Andrew, Iowa. Um, it, but it just helps to remove that stigma around reproductive health. If we start talking about it earlier, I've been talking about this a lot lately about, cause I've got a niece who's 10 and um, we're talking about periods now and it's, I'm seeing some of her, you know, her peers, they're, they don't know what it is. They don't, and, and there's shame and stigma and lack of education. And I think that just exacerbates it as individuals get older. So the more that the faith community can do to destigmatize this, to talk about reproductive health as a part of healthcare. We don't get like this when we talk about dermatology or pulmonology. Like, can we just can we treat the reproductive organs like an like an every other organ, so that we don't have to whisper about these things? And if you get someone comfortable talking about puberty and menstruation, maybe it gets them to a place where they're more comfortable talking about abortion when the time comes. Amen. <laughs> and our whole lives, I'm so glad you mentioned that, is wonderful curriculum. Uh, and if, you know, people are looking for a place to start having those conversations, that is a great place to start. And I think really fact-based curriculum around reproductive health is so important. Um, so like, they titled it in our schools this year, the segment on sex ed, which parents get notified about because you can opt out. They titled it risky business. <laughs> so, I mean, I just felt like it was already giving a negative connotation. And I mean, I was highly offended by that. Um, you know, the average age of sexual abuse in the United States of America is age nine. Mm. So I think it is also very important for our kids to know what is healthy relationships with our bodies and make them comfortable. So maybe they're a little bit more comfortable speaking out if something inappropriate happens at home as well. So I think it spans so many issues. I love the idea of it coming in an open, safe place, such as faith-based organizations. I grew up in the Catholic church. Church, so we all know how that one um, rolls out. But um, all the same, I, I, I think there's lots of work to be done. And I applaud you for doing this series. I think these types of series are one that hopefully can open conversations for people, maybe reach out, whether it's to their um, faith-based leaders or someone in the community or their healthcare providers to maybe get a little more factual information and maybe hopefully sway them to understand that there are other perspectives seeking reproductive choices that maybe are not their own because maybe they haven't had to have those challenging decisions face them, which is a blessing for them, but it's not everyone's world. On that note, I want to thank each of you. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation. Dr. Amy Bingman, Reverend Debbie Griffin, Amanda Kimber, thank you so much. And just to reiterate, abortion is health care. Mm -hmm. Again, our goal for Faithful Conversations on Abortion is to help communities hold what may on the surface be difficult conversations, but we hope you will use this series to help in those conversations whenever your community, wherever your community may be on that journey. Thank you to each of you watching, not only this conversation, but each of the conversations. We hope that the series is beneficial to you.
For more information about this work in Interfaith Alliance of Iowa, you can go to our website at interfaithallianceiowa.org. Again, thank you, Dr. Bingaman, Esther Debbie, Amanda. I am grateful for your work and for your time. Thank you and take care. Thank you.